for joining us for the IEEE Computer Society Standards Webinar Series, brought to you by the Standards Activities Board. With over 225 standards that transform the way we live, work, and communicate, the IEEE Computer Society sets the standard for design automation, simulation, testing technologies, Ethernet and Wi-Fi, quality assurance processes, systems architecture, DevOps, and more. Standards deliver best practice processes for developing market-ready interoperating systems, products, and services. You can have an impact by joining one of the over 200 IEEE Computer Society Standards Working Groups. Participating in one of the working groups grants you access to information that reduces risks, increases proficiency, and shapes the future of the industry. Help determine what's next in computing technology. Learn more about our standard working groups at computer.org slash standards. Okay, so hello everyone. Thank you for joining us today and welcome to today's webinar from our standard activity board series and today's presentation from the Functional Safety Standards Committee. My name is Edward Au, and I am the Vice Chair of the IEEE Computer Society Standards Activity Boards. Before we get started, I would like to adjust some housekeeping items. This webinar is being recorded. You can ask any questions in the Q&A box you see on your screen. The speakers will answer as many questions as possible. When submitting a question, please reference the slide. You go will be and now for a quick question or two after each presenter, and then we will bring all of our five speakers back online for a formal Q&A at the end. A copy of the slides and the recorded webinar will be emailed to you tentatively tomorrow. The IEEE Functional Safety Standard Committee is one of the many initiatives our society, the Computer Society, puts towards standard development, join our global community for the opportunity to get involved as part of our network, you can connect with professionals from all over the world through our working groups, conference, and technical communities. Furthermore, you can stay up to date with the latest in research with our Bi Money News Lecture, Computing Edge. More information will be shared after the webinar. You can also learn more from our society webpage at computer.org. Circling back to today's presentation with all of our five speakers. Functional safety is very important to all of us. The Functional Safety Standard Committee focuses on developing cutting edge standards in this area with application fields such as automotive, industrial, and high performance computing. In this webinar, we will have a live discussion with the speakers about their work in this committee. And before we kickstart, I also want to let you know that, um, sorry, the push to the um, that, as we show in this night, per the IEEE Standard Board Bylaw for this conference webinar, an individual presenting information on the IEEE standards shall make clear that um, this is their views, should be considered as personal views of that individual rather than the formal position of IEEE. And then our first speaker is actually um, Dr. Ricardo Mariani. Ricardo is widely recognized as an expert in functional safety and integrated circuit reliability. In his current role as Vice President of Industry Safety at Invidiger, he is responsible for developing safety strategies and cross segment safety process architecture and products that can navigate across NVIDIA AI-based hardware and software platforms. Prior to joining NVIDIA, he was functional safety technologist at Intel Corporation. Ricardo spent the belt of his career as CTO of UTAC and industry leader in functional safety technologies. He has contributed to multiple industry standards efforts, including his current role as the founding chair of the Functional Safety Standard Committees. He is the recipient of the IEEE 2021 Vaughan Waxman DASC Service Award. Ricardo, um, thank you for joining us today and please, um, it is your forward to share with our audience about what your standard committee is doing. 
Okay, um, many thanks, Edward, for the nice introduction. I'm very glad uh, to be in this webinar. So what I'm going to uh, uh, describe is uh, which is the scope of the FSSC, that is a committee that is handling functional safety standard. So first, what is functional safety? Functional safety is a part of safety. Safety is a, is a big thing. It includes system safety. It includes also uh, operating safety, health and care safety, as also safety of the intended functionalities. In this case, we focus more on functional safety. So functional safety is a part of the overall safety of a system uh, or a piece of equipment that should operate correctly in response to its inputs and avoid hazards that could harm people or environment. So the, the scope of the FSSC is to cover functional safety related initiative like standards within the IEEE that are, have some relationship with functional safety. So we focus on architectures, uh, methodologies, also tools that they address functional safety Another aspect related to safety, including, as I mentioned earlier on, safety of the intended functionality, are many different levels of abstraction. So we cover system, system of system, hardware and software. As also as mentioned by Edward, we are also covering many application fields in which safety is a critical aspect. Automotive, of course, you are all aware uh, of like autonomous vehicle, but industrial, I mean, functional safety in industrial exists since many years, and we've also covered new application like autonomous robots, avionics, and any kind of uh, other type of a transportation, railways, drones, others, and also HPC. You may ask why safety is important in HPC. Well, a lot of things happening in these days as also related to cloud services and the place of the cloud is also involved in functional safety you may think things like over the air update but also of course artificial intelligence that is one of the key technologies of our days that are also functional safety implication and then hpc and accelerated so uh, type of computing is also scope of the fssc uh, functional safety is part of uh, uh, aspects we call dependability. That is not just safety or system safety, but also cover things like cybersecurity, reliability, real-time interaction, and artificial intelligence. So even if we don't cover those aspects, in, uh, let's say, as a scope, but we cover the, the relationship in between those aspects and functional safety. And then we move to the next slide. So uh, what uh, we are covering in the webinar is mainly the work we have done in the first year of Alpha of activity. FSCC has a lot of members, a lot of uh, experts in this field, as also embeds several activities. Those are the four initiatives that we will discuss about. First, uh, we will go through with Joytica uh, about the work done on the IEEE P2851. It has a key standard uh, for functional safety data format for interoperability within the dependability lifecycle. So Joytica will describe where we are. We are quite an advanced state. And, uh, and also what's next. Also one work we did was uh, we created a subgroup uh, with Darren and then we developed a white paper on classification of existing, existing functional safety standard, not just within IEEE, but within other many SDOs like uh, ISO, 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 ISO uh, UL and so forth. Uh, and do a comparison, in particular a comparison of several safety-related definitions included in those standards. In fact, uh, one of the typical issues we have in functional safety that the same definition 
in different standards may have a different meaning. So what we, the work we try to do, and Darren will explain, and, and likely it will be a live effort, so we will also keep the white paper alive, is how we understand each other in this kind of a terminology and taxonomy. Then we, uh, we will give an overview of the new work started named the P3332 standard by Rob Schaff. It is a very important standard as well for control-oriented system safety analysis. I mean, as explained earlier on, FSSC uh, focused on different level of uh, abstraction and system level and system of system are more and more important due to the complexity of things. So that uh, we will show the work that just started uh, and, and where we are going to go. And then, so last but not least, we also study uh, um, a topic that is somehow on uh, what we call prognostic and predictive maintenance. This is a part of safety. Uh, it's also strictly related with reliability and is trying to understand how we can detect failure before they happen. This could happen in hardware, this could happen at system level, and so how uh, it's related to the physics of elements, but also related to how we, um, we identify also methods and measure to identify those aspects. And this will be covered by Andrea. Andrea. So those are the four uh, activities. Others also we started, and others will happen this year. So I also would like to invite uh, if you are interested in this topic, you should join FSSC and also also gives you your idea and you can also give uh, ideas to study groups and, and new activities. So I will say that this is my overview and then I will then leave to um, Joytica to go ahead with the, with the IEEE P2851. Thank you for your great overview of the standard committees, Ricardo. I understand from your slide, yeah, actually many parallel standard development activities ongoing in your committee. Thanks again for your leadership and also for developing high quality market value and getting edge standards that are important to our society, IEEE and also the IEEE. Ricardo, we look forward to hear more from you and your members in the next about 60 minutes and in future. So our next speaker, is Jodica Acevedo. Jodica is the 2023 president elect of our society, the IEEE Computer Society. She is an experienced leader and influencer in emerging technologies and international standardization initiatives. She was awarded the IEEE Computer Society Golden Core Award in 2022. She chairs the IEEE P2851 standard on functional safety and probability. With over 25 years of industry experience, Judica is currently a senior technical leader in automotive functional safety at NVIDIA and is driving capability development, safety architectures and methodologies, system safety engineering activities and part funding for safety critical markets. She was Previously with Intel Corporation as a principal director and principal engineer and director, where she lead the functional safety platform architectures for automotive use case and drove methodologies for radiation effect monitoring and product qualification activities. Outside of the IEEE, Judica is actively influencing several international standards initiatives on functional safety, including ISO, SAV, and UL. Judica, Thanks again for all the work and leadership you have for our society and for P2851. Please, now you have the floor to share with all of us the great work of this standard. Thank you. Thank you so much, Edward, for the kind introduction and uh, for um, organizing this uh, webinar. I really appreciate uh, the opportunity to share this topic. I'll be talking about uh, the IEEE P2851 standard here uh, in my role as, as chair. This is a standard, as Ricardo mentioned, for functional safety data format, for interoperability uh, within the dependability lifecycle. And it is a family of standards. Um, 
we are currently working on the base standard uh, that is in development, um, also is, is getting close to publication later this year. Uh, but before I dive into the details of B2851 specifically, I just wanted to have this slide here that talks a little bit about, you know, the role of uh, IEEE versus the other standards development organizations uh, with, with uh, respect to safety. Um, you know, we do have some mainstream standards for safety that are driven uh, out of other SDOs like ISO and IEC, RTCA for um, automotive, industrial and avionics. Uh, and so when IEEE started work on, on functional safety, uh, the idea there was to complement uh, the work that is being done by the other SDOs by providing additional guidance for aspects or gaps that are not covered by those mainstream standards, such as covering uh, implementation guidance, supporting interoperability, uh, connecting the various domains, uh, covering standardization gaps, and addressing overarching aspects. And uh, one of those gaps uh, is being you know, covered by P2851, uh, where we cover uh, defining a dependability life cycle, but also uh, enabling the exchange of data uh, in an interoperable way across uh, the boundaries of the application domains, across the boundaries, uh, across levels, uh, and also across the dependable technologies. So that's uh, the scope of um, the IEEE 2851 here that you see on this slide are the various companies or entities. This is an entity-based working group, uh, which means uh, the entity is uh, either a company or a university uh, that can join. Uh, and it can have voting rights to the working group. Uh, currently, we have over 30 companies that are part of this uh, standardization committee, uh, primarily um, IP and IC providers, as well as EDA vendors, although we do have some tier ones and OEMs as well. We also have some uh, members who are participating in an observer role. Uh, and uh, currently, over 70 active individuals are, are part of the working group. Um, so here's a slide that describes, you know, what is P2851 or how does that sit with respect to all of the other standards in functional safety. As you can see here are the various application domains. We have the automotive, the industrial robotics, and avionics, and the, the mainstream standards there, such as the ISO 26262, the ISO 21448, and the UL4600 for automotive. Uh, and then we have the standards for robotics and also for avionics. And where P2851 sits, is, is currently um, across, spans across those applications because it provides that common framework uh, in within which uh, data can be exchanged easily across the application domain. So really providing a common set of methodologies, description languages, and databases uh, that will enable that seamless um, exchange of data, uh, not only across these application domains, but also within a given domain uh, across the IP. I see uh, system and item levels, uh, and then also across um, the other dependable technologies. So looking at functional safety uh, engineering activities, but also considering implications from cybersecurity, reliability, availability, maintainability in real time. So that is uh, the position. Uh, uh, the working group uh, published a white paper uh, June of 2021, where we introduced uh, th this notion of a dependability life cycle. Uh, and this was also in alignment with the V model. Uh, so as you can see here on the right, the V model, uh, which also applies to the ISO 26262. And, and leveraging that V model, we defined uh, you know, what the dependability life cycle was. Now, as you can see here in this V model, we have partitioned here the various levels. So we have the part, unit, component, system, and item. And, and as you traverse this V model, uh, as a safety engineer would go through all of the activities starting from concept all the way through production, uh, and goes through implementing or executing the, the various activities uh, that span across this V model, there are certain methodologies, description languages, uh, and databases that need to be considered uh, for each of those activities. So there are certain uh, tools, certain methods that need to be executed at each stage. And, and as, as we do that execution, we need to, to consider how we can make those activities interoperable. Uh, on the left side is an example of how that uh, interoperability can be achieved across the various uh, dependable technologies. 
uh, by considering a staggering approach. Uh, in this case, the order or the sequence in which the, the dependability attributes have been considered is merely for illustration, uh, serving as one example, starting with uh, the functional requirements definition, then considering uh, performance or availability requirements, considering the implication of reliability, uh, safety and SODIF, as well as cybersecurity, and then iterating across these various uh, dependability attributes uh, such that we, you know, come up with a holistic um, uh, set of requirements, uh, a holistic architecture that considers all of these technologies uh, and considers the trade-offs uh, that we would need to make, uh, you know, to 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 address the needs of each of these technologies. So, so here's here's kind of an example of that staggering. Uh, this is for analysis, but as you traverse the new model for each activity, we would need to consider these kinds of uh, implications, uh, the synergies as well as conflicts associated with each of these dependability attributes. Uh, and here's uh, the dependability, dependability lifecycle disk that we also introduced in one of our uh, articles that was published in uh, the computer magazine last year. Um, the P2851 introduced a dual cone V model. Uh, as with the V model, the dual cone V model compromises separate uh, development cones for design and design verification phases and the integration test test or analysis phases. Uh, and both cones together cover the whole spectrum of e development starting at the level of the operational domain the product is intended to work in uh, down to the EE hardware and the software that runs on it. Um, and so we have this dual cone V model where the two cones address uh, the new era of system and chip development. Um, as we know, the SOCs are, are a result of extensive logical and physical design and verification simulation uh, as such compromised software and hardware development at the same time. And that is concurrently. Uh, and as huge software applications are running on the SOCs uh, on the SOC, though having a high performance capability by itself needs a lot of hardware resources for being brought into its point of operation, the dual core cone B model emphasizes the necessity of two separate hardware and software design and test processes in parallel. So without getting into too many too much detail on the dual cone B model, I, I want to make wanted to emphasize that this is still in alignment with the methodology uh, or the overall set of activities that are described in the mainstream standards, such as ISO 26262 uh, and the IEC 61508, uh, you know, considering uh, the V model and considering the order of the sequence of execution of the various uh, design verification, integration and test activities. Here on this slide, uh, we have uh, a list of few of the needs and requirements that have been identified by the P2851 working group. Uh, these are topics that have been considered uh, for interoperability. So as you as you look at the dependability life cycle and you consider all of the activities that need to be executed in the dependability life cycle, there are certain topics uh, where uh, that are critical in terms of, uh, you know, defining interoperable methodologies, description languages, and databases. Uh, and so the p 2 working group worked to identify these needs in various areas, including uh, functional safety, automotive, AI, cybersecurity, safe, uh, avionics, industrial and medical. Um, here's a snapshot of some of the, the uh, topics. We have a total of about 108 needs that are mapped to various phases of the dependability life cycle, but uh, you, can, you can see some examples here in terms of description languages, such as the safety plan, safety case, external measures or base failure rate, uh, methodologies for dependent failure analysis, ASL decomposition and vulnerability factor modeling, and then databases for various topics such as safety mechanisms or AI training data sets. Uh, and then finally, just wanted to talk about, you know, where we are and what lies ahead. So in terms of our development, uh, we have completed uh, drafting uh, the, the first revision of the base standard, which is a domain agnostic dependability life cycle and has identified the different needs and topics for interoperability. What's going to follow is uh, the DOT standards, which will implement uh, some of the key topics or the high priority needs that we have identified in the base standard. And that will uh, 
you know, that planning will start the second half of this year. Uh, we are looking uh, at publication, publication of the base standard, the base standard uh, uh, at the end of this year. So that's currently uh, where we are at and what lies ahead. I want to thank you all again for listening and joining us today. And thanks, Edward and Scott, for organizing. Thank you, Judica. Actually, um, we have two short questions that we may want you want you to answer. I hope you, it is fine with you. The yes, first absolutely. one is the first one is um, an audience actually is excited about this work and they actually want to join, but they actually do not know how they can join as an entity. Um, do you have any pointer or you want to provide them information offline, Judica? Sure, absolutely. Yeah, I'd be happy to do that. Uh, you know, this is an entity-based working group, so anyone is free to join. It, uh, right now, base membership is free as well, so anyone can join free of, free of cost as an observer. Uh, there is a membership fee associated with the advanced membership, which gives uh, you know the member voting rights. Uh, but I'd be happy to to provide that information. Uh, yeah, here's the, the FSSC mailing list, uh, but there's also a website for the P2851 where folks can mm -hmm. go in there and contact myself or any of the other officers and we could be happy to, to share that. But thanks for the interest. Awesome. And then the next question actually is related to your last slide because um, from what you share with us, you will have um, talk series about the implementation of key interoperability topics. Mm -hmm. So actually the question from the audience is, um, for, for this planned future work, will you and your group consider any test event or podcast also because interoperability maybe it is important to validate by any test event or podcast across different vendors? Um, that is a good input. Uh, so we have not started work on this yet. So that is, you know, going to start in uh, the planning of that will start uh, second half of this year. Uh, and that's mm -hmm. where we would select the topics uh, that we would execute. Uh, and the dot standards, currently we have 108, but we're probably going to uh, only, you know, cover a handful of topics. And for those, uh, if there are if there is such data available or some 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 uh, testing data or uh, actual use cases that we can leverage, I think that would be wonderful. I think the idea here is to to um, to leverage uh, as much of the 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 existing data as as possible, uh, and and you know provide pointers to to any existing data. So, so yeah, I'd be happy to to. Uh, Take a look if anyone has any ideas or thoughts they'd like to share. Awesome. Thank you, Judica. So if there's anyone who is interested for the further work of this standard piece, Joy, Judica and her group for more activities. And then actually, um, the last question maybe, um, because um, actually many people are very exciting about your work. Um, the audience asked, What's the perspective of P2851 regarding the well industry? I mean, more on the train, um, considering it is also one of the safety critical areas with referrals, functional safety achievements, while low reference is found in your introduction. So, so the audience is more about the train business. Rather, the functional safety standard, standard will also apply to their sector. Yeah, it's a good question. I think this has come up a few times. Uh, so currently, even though we are looking at the, the four main domains that we talked about, that is the automotive, uh, industrial, medical, and avionics, uh, we may in the future decide to expand scope to also cover uh, other application domains, such as railways, uh, trains, autonomous ships, or other uh, you know uh, applications as well. Uh, so cur currently, um, the, the base standard looks at those four domains primarily to define this dependability um, life cycle in, in a domain agnostic way. But uh, what will follow is those domain specific um, revisions where we will include annexes with uh, you know, a, a life cycle flow that is more detailed specific to the requirements of the individual domain. And at that time, uh, we may consider uh, adding additional domains uh, you know, as, as needed. So I think um, if there is interest in, in looking at railways as one of those domains, then we could certainly consider that. 
Okay, great. So all you know, for anyone who is interested and excited about this work, please join Jody Care and his com her committee for further development. And thanks again, Jody Care. And we will Thank bring you, so you back at the end for maybe a Q&A. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, so then our, excuse me. Sorry, our next speaker is Darren Gabin. Darren is currently a director of functional safety and quality hardware at Sci5, and he has over 25 years experience in verification, product engineering, and system architecture. He is currently the chair of the IEEE 1647 Functional Verification Language E, secretary to the standing committees FSSC, and also is an active participant to Jody Case Group IEEE P 2851 helping to drive the verification and validation chapter. He led a subgroup of the standing committee to draft a white paper on functional safety landscape and has participated in many important activities related to functional safety and also the UCIS standard. Darren, thank you very much for accepting our uh, invitation to share with our audience about the great Ray paper that your subgroup has been developing. So you now have the floor. Thank you so much. Great. Thanks very much for the introduction, Edward. Okay, so when we set up the uh, the committee and started talking, it was quite obvious that yeah, there is a functional safety landscape out there, but it's kind of a bit like a sea of Iceland islands, loosely connected by causeways. You've got different groups like the ISO, IEEE, UL, IET. Um, there are others, um, and although memberships overlap no one person or group really belongs to them all and they t quite often target different domains have different nomenclatures and it means when we're talking to each other it can sound as if we understand each other but quite often we don't and there are um, s small inconsistencies and misunderstandings that arise as a result that's not to say that in the past consolidation hasn't been attempted so um, for example, the IEEE, IET, and ISO group together to provide a common dictionary. But if you go online and find the dictionary, it's really uh, an aggregation of the different definitions used in the standards that each group has. So there's been no attempt at rationalizing them. If there are differences, then they're all listed together and given just different sub-number entries in the dictionary. And as a result, you can have an entry for a term which has different definitions which don't actually agree with each other. For example, does an error cause a fault or does a fault cause an error? So we felt that there was a need for a clear, simple set of definitions which cuts across domains and can be used in functional safety standards moving forward. So we hope that if we can develop uh, such a set of definitions, then anything which is sponsored by our standards committee at least, would use these to ensure that we are all talking to each other with the same meaning. So how we went about it. The first thing we did was to form a study group taking in different members from uh, different parts of the, uh, the landscape and to do a survey of the existing literature with members taken from different entities and domains. Uh, and that wasn't a small exercise because even if you have a look at our white paper, we ended up referencing somewhere over a hundred different standards to try and work out um, what the common understanding was and uh, how they were going about defining things. We looked for keywords uh, used in functional safety and the definitions for them. And we aggregated them together on a website where we then argued and did a lot of arguing about what the, was really meant and what the proposals uh, should be and what we want to include. And I think that just reflects um, a the broad nature of the group and also the fact that there are differences in what is in, intended. And um, even within one organization, sometimes that um, definition has changed over time. So having had all that argument, we then selected the terms we thought were the most important and we wrote a draft of the document containing the definitions that we intended to use and also describing the landscape in which those were already used. 
and where possible we try to group um, definitions into um, into ways that they were used um, and, and their meanings and do some contrasting and comparing before um, arriving at what we consider to be our standard. This was then reviewed within the Functional Safety Standards Committee as a whole, and it was published earlier this year, and the link is shown on the web, on, on the uh, slide here. So here are the key words that were defined, and I'm not going to go through them all at this point. I'm going to encourage people to go and read the white paper and find the, the definitions. But it shows that we took a reasonably wide uh, range of uh, terms, some of which seem like they could be obvious, but even if they were obvious, they quite often had multiple definitions. And we've got some contain, you know, defining what is a system, what is an item, um, a hi hierarchy of how they go, go together and may be used. So what do we intend to do next? Well, the aim is that the subgroup will review new standards and papers as they are published to see if there are any new uh, terms which we would want to consider. We also want to collect feedback on the existing document. And if anything new arises from the work uh, we've just referenced above, anything new arrives in, in a new standard, then we want to uh, keep publishing um, revisions to the uh, white paper to so making sure that it stays a live document and doesn't just die. So at that point, I would encourage people, please do get involved. The more input we have in the different domains, the more we can make sure it's applicable to everyone and the more we can try and do to resolve these uh, differences in understandings that arise. So thank you very much and uh, back to you, Edward. Okay, thank you so much, Dari. Dari. <clears throat> so let's see if there's any question that um, anyone would like to um, ask. And then actually, um, we actually have a question about the terminology. Actually, um, the audience believed that it is really great because the point is it helped the industry to make a consistent terminology with one another. But the, um, but um, the member asked, because currently there are so many standards related to functional safety, with this um, important white paper, um, how, how is your plan or the plan of, the st uh, of your standard committee to promote it across different SDO to make sure that they use your terminology and definition? Do you have any insight on your any plan for your future activities, Darren? Thank you. Uh, yes, uh, that's yes, a very that's good question. Um, we have members who are involved in other standards groups, and mm -hmm. they have certainly taken the document and spread it amongst the membership in those other fora so that they are aware of it and can use it going forward. And additionally, any new standard which is sponsored and developed under the aegis of the uh, Functional Safety Standards Committee we'll be using this so we can make sure that anything going forward is at least um, consistent. However, I'm, as I said, because we kind of have these islands of functional safety scattered around, not everyone is involved in all of them. And is, as we have these interactions, particularly through things such as the 2851, where we get introduced to uh, more different bodies, then we can uh, start to introduce this as, as a reference and uh, make sure that um, others see what's done and uh, try and use it awesome yeah so hopefully um more and more people will understand the importance of this right paper and try to adopt the terminology for their standards or otherwise it may create confusion as you mentioned so thank you so much Darren. Yeah. thank you okay so i see no more question for now so we will go on to the next speaker but let me project this night first I suppose is um sorry for the delay. So it should be this one. P3232. So um thank you, Darren, again for the presentation about the right paper. So now we have our second last speaker, Rob Soft. Rob wants a software management and system engineering practice. Previous employments was with ITT, IBM, and Philips. 
in teleco management and teleco and management positions, or is concerning the development and operation of large, complex software defined systems offered as products and services across a wide range of industries. His management skill is distributed engineering management. His technical interests go to various qualities of software systems, including performance, safety, and recently, the ethical value borne by the autonomous systems. The qualities are often, and to a degree, emerging in neutral, requiring forms of engineering on the boundary between development and operations. As a volunteer, Rob has participated in the development of the IEEE software and system engineering standards from its early day. Rob, thanks again uh, for accepting our invitation to present here and please share with us the great work of P3332. Thank you, Rob. Thank you, Edward, for the introduction. Uh, my uh, brief uh, presentation uh, will uh, touch on uh, uh, three topics. Uh, uh, if uh, this is the standard for uh, control-oriented system safety analysis, I will work backwards. I start with uh, 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 a few words about uh, system safety analysis. Then I will address uh, control in particular. And finally, I will have a chart, a slide on the uh, project and working group to uh, bring this uh, standard into existence. Uh, so I start with uh, system safety analysis. Uh, and I interpret uh, system safety here and safety in particular as uh, the freedom from harm. Uh, freedom from harm means that uh, you need an absence of potential sources of harms. Potential sources of harms, uh, I, I abbreviate as hazards. And then when it comes to uh, the analysis of uh, this system safety, I distinguish between uh, three uh, approaches. Each pro, uh, labeled uh, component, uh, event chain, and control. Each approach uh, can have multiple methods. So uh, uh, there, uh, uh, when it comes, for example, to the component uh, uh, approach, you can have multiple component-oriented uh, methods. Anyway, the first uh, approach starts from the components of a system of interest, establishes the modes of failure, and computes system safety from the contributions of the component failures. Failure modes and effects analysis, uh, FEMIA, is a particular method from the class of component-oriented analysis methods. The second approach starts from a failure event, say a house fire, and identifies the various preceding events in the causal change that can lead to the house on fire. From the probabilities in the event change, the second approach computes the probability of the ultimate failure event, in this case, the house on fire. Fold tree analysis is a particular method from the class of event-oriented analysis methods. Next, we have the class of control-oriented analysis methods. But before I go into that, I should emphasize that our project to develop a standard for control-oriented analysis is premised on the idea that uh, the three approaches to system safety analysis that are shown here are complementary. Yes, uh, it's true that the first two approaches are keyed off from the concept of failure and as such distinguish themselves from the third approach, uh, which is uh, still kind of an unconventional uh, approach 
but we don't hold uh, one approach uh, as better than the other. And we see all three approaches as valuable and we see them as potentially being used on one and the same case. Now, what about the control-oriented approach? Uh, let me, I flip to one too fast. There we go. First of all, I need to talk about the control model. It's a very simple model. It, it consists of two blocks, uh, uh, the uh, controller and the control process, uh, uh, connected with, on the one hand, uh, control actions, and on the other hand, uh, the feedback. The control model is nothing else than a view of the world, and in our case, a view of the system of interest and its uh, environment, its operating environment. When we talk about control here, uh, the system is not necessarily a control system. Remember, this control model is a view of the world, and that world is much more than control systems alone. I should also say that the control model is uh, widely used not only in the, uh, and particularly not in the uh, safety area, but outside. Uh, uh, the safety area as well. I, for, for one, uh, many years ago, uh, my first encounter with the control model was in the analysis of a uh, real-time operating system. Next, uh, uh, I used it uh, for the uh, analysis of an airline uh, reservation system that was running out of power. Uh, so that was uh, used in performance analysis. And then I got into uh, incident uh, investigations, and I've used the control model in literally tens of these uh, incident uh, investigations. So it's uh, widely used uh, in various domains. And in fact, uh, the, the safety area is kind of a latecomer when it comes to the uh, application of the control model. Now, with the control model, we have control loops. Uh, these loops circle between the controller and the control process, uh, mediated by uh, the control actions and the feedback. But also, these loops don't necessarily have to be closed. They can be open loops uh, any way you want. In the loops, very important uh, is our software, humans and failures. So while I talk about control, I don't want to ignore that there are failures in the loop as well. There are certainly humans in our uh, in the loop in our complex systems. And specifically for uh, this particular project, we assume that all systems uh, of interest uh, are software intensive systems. With these loops, I want to emphasize one particular kind of control action, that is the unsafe control actions. They are central to what we are doing and what we are trying to get uh, standardized uh, in this uh, document. Control actions that create a hazard. Now we get to the control-oriented system safety analysis. That means at design time, we search uh, for unsafe control actions, as in figure A. We also, at design time, we define constraints, as in B, and uh, keep in uh, mind that these constraints can be implemented in the form of system functionality or in the form of operational rules for the system of interest. Okay, moving on to the project and the working group. First of all, the standard itself. We look at the standard as a, a set of requirements for the class of <laughs> control-oriented methods. Specifically, 
this standard is not going to describe an individual method. With these requirements, we keep them industry and application agnostic. And as I already mentioned, they will be uh, based and assume uh, and reflect uh, that we are talking about software intensive systems. For best results of this standard, it should be used with an ecosystem of system engineering standards. Remember, this is a standard with a set of requirements and, and, and a practice, of course, is much more than the application of a set of uh, uh, requirements or principles. So we need uh, very much an ecosystem uh, for the system engineering standards. To that end, this standard, this 332 standard, uh, will be uh, compatible with, but not dependent upon the ISO IEC IEEE standards 15288 and 12207, which are the kernel, uh, the core of the system and software engineering standards. When it comes to the working group, the working group, uh, as already mentioned, is sponsored by uh, the Functional Safety Standards Committee, uh, chaired by Ricardo. Uh, the working group started in uh, uh, March this year, and we have a most aggressive uh, objective uh, to have at least uh, a first standard by the end of this year. Finally, uh, this working group is a great opportunity for people who share an interest in the approach to safety analysis that differs from the conventional uh, focus on failure. If you're interested, uh, the link is shown here uh, for joining the working group. Thank you very much. Over to you, Edward. Thank you, Rob. So actually, there's a question more for from my point of view is clarification, because um, at the beginning, you mentioned something about the system safety. Because um, it's maybe in one of your earliest knife. And then the audience actually, um, yeah, it's mentioned sa system safety. So actually, the audience is asking, it is the case that your standard committee is, is extending the stroke to cover not only functional safety, but also cover system safety. The answer is yes. Mm -hmm. uh, 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 at the end, of course, uh, it's also functional safety because uh, the, uh, let me, uh, uh, yeah, because it may, may be a very long, discussion about what is the difference between functional safety and system safety. <laughs> when you look here, uh, yeah. uh, towards the bottom of this slide, you see design time definition of constraints. Constraints that uh, constrain the system from issuing unsafe control actions. Now, these constraints are, uh, are a matter of functionality. So, uh, uh, yes, at the same time, I'm talking about system safety and functional safety. I'm combining the two in, in one of the same um, uh, uh, scope. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you so much. So this is really a great initiative. So if the member who asked the question interested in not only functional safety, but also system safety, they should join your group as soon as possible to contribute. Absolutely. And thank you, Rob. Thank you again. So now we go on to the last speaker. So let me project DS9 first. So our last speaker for today is Angel Mabilchi. Angel is a senior product manager, solution architect, and safety expert with over 15 years of professional experience in automotive development from prototypes to mass production of power chain applications diagnosis, and ADAS, AD high-end scalable architecture. Andrew joined protein tags in 2020 to lead the design of automotive safety compliance solutions. She was previously served as the chief software architect at Samsung Electronics. She was also a product owner of Cetidu and platform solution 
sorry, platform project manager at Posture in Germany. Andrew, I understand that you are leading a study group to consider something new and exciting about the prediction techniques applied to functional safety. So you now have the forum to share with us what your study group is doing and how our audience can join your activities. Thank you. Thank you, Edward. Thank you for the introduction. Yes, um, um, we have this prognosis study group has been founded um, uh, one year ago uh, within the FFSC um, with the scope uh, of um, so prognostic and prediction, prediction, predicting techniques applied to functional safety. So prognostic is uh, in, in one sentence is the ability to predict by when the system is going to fail. So in conversion to diagnostic, that is the detection prognostic is the ability to predict. So it, 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 it is clearly, as uh, Ricardo mentioned in the introduction, clearly a, a strong implication for the functional safety of a system. Now, um, the, um, the study group could, so this is a very big topic, a huge topic. We could have uh, uh, endless discussion. So. At the very begin, uh, we decided to narrow the scope uh, um, to a simpler question. What, um, what is covered already uh, today in the existing standard um, regarding uh, prognostics? Uh, and uh, if what is eventually missing? What we can, um, what we can suggest as gaps for uh, future, uh, for future works? So, The starting from uh, um, functional safety standards today, uh, of course, it covers two things we will know. Uh, so the systematic prevention of failures by robust design, good design, and the ability to minimize the risks um, using safety mechanisms. So what are the necessary, uh, uh, the, what are the, 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 the tools, the implementation that we should consider for the entire um, operational life? So for all the uh, for all the activities of our system before retirement. So ultimately, um, maintenance is, of course, one of the, the phases uh, considered in uh, any standards, any functional safety standard. But when it is about the, the, the predictive maintenance, so the ability to, um, to act upon predictions, so the, the, uh, the appliance, the integration of prognostics, actually, the current standards are... Um, are falling short. They they do not uh, specifically, namely, consider. Uh, uh, they, they don't provide any guidance uh, for the integrators, for the designers, how to consider prognostics. So, um, if we if we then go to the to the current state of the art in general, um, there are um, well we can. Uh, we can simply group uh, the, the the prognostic techniques in uh, in uh, in two groups. So the model based, the analytical way. So how to um, based on sensor data um, and monitors uh, during the operational condition. How to eventually predict by uh, so the remaining useful life. This this, this is the short form of rule. Huh? Or the um, the data driven techniques. So uh, statistical or for example machine learning applied to uh, analyzing raw data and then extracting uh, the, the information and, the, and based on upon that predict by, this, uh, so predict by when the system is going to fail. So identifying patterns and trends. These techniques, of course, they, they are not exclusively, they, they don't exclude each other. Um, and uh, as you can see, ultimately they both rely on, uh, on data. So uh, sensor data, uh, collected during the normal operation, during the uh, the the, uh, the operating time of the system, and um, and uh, they have both ultimately a statistical approach. There is indeed an existing standard, an IEEE standard, the 1856, uh, published in 2018. The full name is a Standard Framework for Prognostic and Health Management of Electronic Systems. So there is a standard that covers uh, prognostics, um, even if it doesn't ex explicitly address uh, any um, any 
uh, any functional safety uh, aspects as we are used to uh, to find in the, the existing, in the state of the art of functional safety standards. But it provides a, um, a, a good framework and in particular the definition that we can use uh, uh, to describe the metrics that we can use to define to describe the prognostics. So here there is just a uh, just an overview, a short overview of what are the prognostic metrics. Um, we don't have, of course, the time to go into the details or to go into to review all of those. But I want just to give a glance of uh, what are the, the what are the difficulties uh, if you uh, as a as a system designer or uh, integrator you are you're interested to to use uh, prognostics or predictive maintenance techniques into your system for the functional safety of it. Um, so, for example, um, as also Daro uh, mentioned at the beginning, um, Darren, uh, here he's following the pattern that is also described into in the ISO 26262. So, a fault is causing an error that will lead to the failure of the system. This picture that you see in the, uh, at the bottom of the of the um, um, of the presentation of the slide is from the uh, IEEE 1856 uh, standard, but it but is prognostic distance is the same as uh, the FTTI, the fault tolerance time interval? Well, is not in the sense that uh, in this case the idea is that a fault will lead will cause uh, an error and the error will cause the failure of a system. So there is at least order of magnitude uh, of difference between this, uh, uh, this uh, prognostic distance. So this time is much longer. So it's hours, days, months uh, before the failure of, uh, or of the system. So now um, the, the outlook, so our conclusion. There is uh, um, definitely uh, the space for uh, um, for uh, applying a product, uh, prognostic methodology as a safety mechanism. So, um, and yet uh, uh, we don't have um, uh, we have we don't have the definition or, or the, the the right terminology that covers that in yeah. in the functional safety context. So. Um, there are um, there is a gap in terms of uh, what are the best metrics, what are the best, uh, what are the requirements, and uh, such kind of um, um, of gaps uh, uh, should be considered by the working groups uh, um, that are um, uh, they are they are eventually uh, updating the existing functional safety standards. Um, our uh, contribution as a, as a study group. Uh, now is uh, will be um, will be let's say summarized in a in a report um, that we are now um, we are now writing and reviewing uh, that we want to present in the functional safety uh, committee so in the FFSC and um, well of course uh, um, if you are interested uh, please do get involved the um, the discussion is still open we we want still to refine it and. Um, and we hope to give uh, uh, the, the the right outlook uh, for uh, uh, for the future edition of uh, uh, functional safety standards um, to properly consider prognostic uh, or in general predictive maintenance into uh, the safety concepts. Thank you, Rob. So actually, um, I have a question from the audience. Sorry, thank you, Andrew. <laughs> I have a, a no question problem. from the audience, but. Actually, before that, I may want to ask a clarification question, Andrew. I suppose for the your past study group is not only deliver a final report, but maybe a proposed project proposal, so that the standard committee and the standard association may approve for a new project, right? At least your no, plan. Not, oh. not yet, not yet. Is a, is mm -hmm. a only a study group? With the, with the idea to investigate uh, eventually the, the 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 need for a new standard and uh, and then propose a par. Um, so there's no par yet. No par yet, exactly. Mm -hmm. Therefore, wow. the idea was to consolidate our conclusion and in, into this uh, uh, into this report, 
and um, and then also start getting let's say the interest of uh, of the existing standards uh, um, working groups i see thanks yeah so actually the 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 the, the member question is i mean the audience question is from from their point of view it's exciting to talk about metrics and requirements but how about methodologies will methodologies be the stroke of the future work because um the member point of view is maybe for prediction maybe we need to consider ai or ml or the other exciting your know, artificial intelligence techniques to do so do you have any insight on that Andrew? well as i mentioned it, mm -hmm. th there are many different techniques already applied to um to um, in, into uh, in different domains so mainly avionics for example um uh, is um is is one of the precursor let's say one of the um, anticipator of these techniques applied to big systems so the mm -hmm. existing uh, state of the art uh, is banking on uh, on their publications and their investigation or and uh, actually we we have seen that they uh, they use both techniques, so inductive and deductions, and so, uh, and uh, and both uh, relies, as I mentioned, to sensor data. So, um, the, one of the key uh, parameter, I think, is uh, what kind of data, when, and uh, and how many of this data. So, um, it's difficult to say. Uh, let's say. Um, it's difficult to name techniques. Uh, let's say far, most uh, most prominent techniques uh, versus others. But I think mm -hmm. that as soon as we define the right metrics, so what kind of uh, confidence level, what kind of uh, confidence interval, uh, what expected uh, failure rate, uh, or uh, let's say false positive or false negative rates, just to mention some the the the, the possible metrics that we can choose. So define the requirements for those will eventually select what better what, what are the best techniques that we can use into the uh, into a functional safety concept concept so in this context okay awesome thank you Andrew. so maybe now we have about um six or, or seven minutes we, we would like to bring all of our speakers online and see if anyone have any question to pop some of us or all of us but before that, um, Rob, I just he here. Rob, yeah, yeah. Actually, um, we may have a question for you that um, I I only see it when Andrew present. So actually, um, the audience asks um, from from their point of view, um, the proposed model you have is very close to STPA. That is the System Theoretical Process Analysis. So um, the audience want to know what's the difference, or rather, you um, yeah. He uh, they actually asked you to clarify what's differentiate with it from your P thirty three thirty two. Maybe can you provide some insight on that? Yeah, STBA is a particular method in the class of uh, 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 control oriented system safety analysis method. Uh, we mm -hmm. will uh, highlight uh, the um, uh, the principles, and as I already have said, um, uh, these principles will be formulated in a way that is compatible with the uh, um, IEEE, uh, uh, ISO, and IEC uh, system and software uh, engineering standards. Uh, so we distinguish mm -hmm. ourselves by emphasizing the principles and the uh, compatibility with um, uh, the standards for system and software engineering. Okay, awesome, Rob. Thank you so much for the, for the point about the difference. Okay, so now um, I have a question received from our audience. Um, wow, well, that may be, let's see. Um, actually, um, they understand that for your standing committees, for all the projects that um, you have discussed, it actually not only apply to autonomous system, neither self-driving cars, but also neither high computing systems or the avionics or the industrial application. So the audience question is, 
um, the audience understand that actually safety and security have already been implemented in areas like the self-driving cars and autonomous system. So, so they want to know what lessons learned from, from, from this implementation that we can bring into, for example, industry automation. Can, can any one of you share some light of, of the lesson learned or that based on your experience? That is how the safety in autonomous system can also bring to the, the other applications like industrial automation. Anyone would like to come in first? Yes, Ricardo. Ricardo speaking. Yeah, yeah. I can say just one word. Uh, so I think one of the aspect is the, um, for example, how the composition of safety integrity level can be uh, also considered into those domains, um, and also concept like uh, the use of a monitor in combination with a QM uh, uh, type of a, of a software, those kind of things. So more, I would say, some architectural, so type of a pattern that have been especially used in automotive. I think they are also valid or somehow they are currently explored or used in the industrial robotic, especially when autonomous robots are used. As also, I mean, the whole effort on artificial intelligence cross also all these domains. So this will be my short answer. Thank you, Ricardo. And Judica, sorry to put you on the spot. I just want to make sure it's in the sequential order. I understand also, you know, from your previous employment and your current job, you focus with autonomous systems. So based on your experience and standard activities, how do you think, yeah, the security or the safety can be extended from functional safety and autonomous to other very important applications like industrial automation? Uh, I think other than what Ricardo mentioned, you know, the one of the key ones that I wanted to mention, the other topic is the predictive maintenance and, and you know, Andrea mm -hmm. talked to it uh, in quite detail, but that is one that is especially of importance currently for all safety critical domains. Uh, so I think there's work going on in standardization today on automotive, uh, but I, it, you know, it would be applicable to other domains as well, such as industrial. Uh, and then uh, I think with respect to P2851, it's more of like the cross domain learning also. So I think there mm -hmm. are other aspects, um, for example, uh, in avionics, where we also look at real time compliance and the implication to, to safety, um, you know, with workload consolidation and, you know, considering that those learnings also for industrial automation would be another one that I would, you know, wanted to, to share. Okay, thank you, Judy Kerr. And Darren, I understand you know you you work in the industry very long, over twenty five years with different things, especially you are expert in verification, product engineering, art, and system architecture. So, from your point of view, maybe more from the verification and validation, what lesson learned from from autonomous to other um, applications areas like industrial automation that the uh, member asked? Okay. Um, I think the main ideas behind verification probably haven't changed greatly since I started. Mm -hmm. I mean, you're always trying to um, stimulate or you know, simulate or whether you're doing it formally or design and checking it. I think the difference is in the rigor that you apply and the um, results you're trying to obtain. So whereas before, if you're in a um, consumer space, you might be mm -hmm. happy um, you know, doing the verification quicker and not quite so rigorous because the um, likelihood of something going wrong, or if something does go wrong, there aren't so many serious effects. But even in the consumer space today, um, consumer technologies, people start relying on more and more and they're using them, even if they're not meant to be health devices, they're using them for health. So even mm -hmm. in these now, you've got to start to apply more rigor. So I think that what the functional safety is trying to bring is trying to codify some of that um, rigor and what is 
necessary to demonstrate that you've um, tested it you know to the best in class you can at the time it doesn't mean you do everything because the verification space is too big to realistically do anything even in simple systems these days but we're trying to bring in um, methodologies you should follow and um, describe the techniques you should use so that makes so you're kind of guaranteed at least a minimum level of quality when we're um, de delivering these devices and so also do if you can um, follow the standards and demonstrate it also gives the people who are you know, your customers um, something they can believe and see yeah it's no longer just trust me i know what i'm doing it's trust me i know what i'm doing and by the way i can demonstrate it mm -hmm. awesome thank you so much and rob i understand you are very expert in software and system so darren has his point of view from the hardware verification point of view rob any any insight from the system or software point of view that yeah. you can share with us yeah, let me Please. try. Um, the uh, control model, from my experience, is uh, very friendly in the analysis of systems uh, with emergent behavior. Uh, uh, behavior that is uh, not foreseen or hard to uh, foresee uh, at the time, uh, at design time. Uh, now, uh, my uh, view, uh, uh, I've been dealing, uh, I, I've called um, uh, emergent behavior the, be, uh, the bane of uh, system and software engineering, uh, the, the uh, eternally returning uh, trouble. Um, but uh, the control model is uh, uh, fairly friendly to dealing with emergent behavior. Uh, besides that, I look at uh, uh, artificial intelligence and mach uh, machine learning as, uh, for me, it's a an, an, uh, problem of emergent behavior. So I have hoped that I can convince the working group uh, to uh, uh, put some emphasis on this and, and uh, make the uh, uh, standard applicable very much to the area of autonomous behavior, uh, artificial intelligence, and machine learning. We'll see where this ends up. Awesome. Thank you, Rob. So I should ask also, Andrew, Andrew, I also understand you, know, you have lots of experience from prototype to mass production, but mainly on the automotive. So I understand the audience actually ask questions extend over the automotive, like industrial automation. Do you have any comment or insight that you also want to share with the audience? Um, yes. Uh, one one important trend in our in automotive is um, um, is this always connected systems that produces <laughs> an incredible amount of data. And this is uh, necessary for the development of autonomous driving, but ultimately for for the system to operate, right, in a reliability, reliability manner, in a, in a safe manner, uh, and uh, up to the customer expectation. And uh, well, this is a trend that we can see in every domain, ultimately. So even the the the, the consumers, IoT devices, that they are more and more connected, more and more. So always on and uh, able to produce and to consume data um, mm -hmm. uh, locally m m more than than ever, right? So um, I think that there are commonalities here. So it will be easy to uh, to to share technologies across the domains um, because we are we are increasing the capabilities, but also simply the 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 need to produce and consume data locally in every domain. So um, th th I think that uh, more than before, th there will be a, 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 will be a yeah, share of technologies and, and capabilities. Awesome. Thank you so much, Andrew. And actually, I understand that we are now over one already by four minutes. So um, for all of our speakers here, is there any last minute thing you want to share with the group before I conclude the talk? Anything anyone would like to speak? I would just okay. uh, encourage people, yeah. please 
get in contact. Awesome. So like, That's why I show the slide here. So for anyone of you who is interested in this standing committee, please join their work. Um, you know, this is the great way to contribute your expertise and then to have an interaction with many industry leading experts. But anyway, once again, I would like to thank Ricardo, Judica, Darren, Rob, and Angel for joining us today and sharing what is going on in the world of functional safety. Uh, quick last minute, quick programming notes. Our society will host three different webinars in the near future. On June 8th, join us for a special presentation about public speaking. We have invited a great speaker to share with us how to overcome the fear of public speaking. And if you would like to know more about Metaverse and also the cyber world standards, please join us for the next standard webinar on June 9th, 11. Our speakers will deliver an introduction to interfacing cyber and physical world standards that one of our society standard committee has been developing. And lastly, on July 13, we will have another webinar entitled Leading Positive Change. During this webinar, we will explore the key elements of successful change leadership, including communication, collaboration, and a clear vision for the future. Once again, I would like to thank all of our speakers and our society staff for joining us today and for all of you for attending and for a lively q and discussion. Thank you again. And all of you have a great rest of your day. So the webinar is concluded. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks all for joining. Have a good day. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you all.